Recording by Kelly Taylor. Show Business by Boyd Ellenby. Except for Old Dworkin, Cotha's bar was deserted when I dropped in shortly after midnight. The ship from Earth was still two days away, and the Martian flagship would get in the next morning, with 700 passengers for Earth on it. Dworkin must have been waiting in Luna City for a whole week, at 6,000 credits a day. That's as steep to me as to you, but money seemed to never worry Dworkin. He raised the heavy green lids from his protruding brown eyes as I came in. He waved his tail. Sit down and join me, he invited in his guttural voice. It is not good for a man to drink alone, but I have no company in this by the gods deserted hole. A man must something be doing, why? I sat down in the booth across from my Venusian friend and stared at him while he punched a new order into the drink board. For me, another shiga, he announced. And for you, the same? Against my better judgment, for I knew I'd have plenty to do with that mob of tourists, the first crowd of the season is always the roughest tomorrow. I consented. Dworkin had already consumed six of the explosive things, as the empty glasses on the table showed, but he exhibited no effects. I made a mental note, as I'd so often done before, that this time I would not exceed the safe terrestrial limit of two. You must be on the money again, drinking imported shtika, I remarked. What are you doing in Luda City this time? He merely lifted his heavy eyelids and stared at me without expression. No, in the money I am not. There are too many cheeselers in business. Just when I think I have a good thing, I am swindled. It is always too bad. He snorted through his ugly snout, making the Venusian equivalent of a sigh. I knew there was a story waiting behind that warty skin, but I was not sure if I wanted to hear it. For the next rounds of drinks would be on me, and shtick had cost a hundred and fifty credits a shot. Still, a man on a moon assignment has to amuse himself somehow. So I said, What's the latest episode in the Dworkin soap opera? What is the merchandise this time? Gems? Pet mercury and fire insects? A new supply of dangara? I do not smuggle drugs. That is a beast lie, replied my friend solidly. He knew, of course, that I still suspected him to be the source of that last load of the potent narcotic, although I had no more proof than did the Planetary Bureau of Investigation. He only took a long pull at his drink before he spoke again. But the working is never down for long. This time it is show business. You remember how I have always been by the theater so fascinated? Well, I decided to open a show here in Luna City. Think of all the travelers, bored stiff by space and the emptiness thereof, who pass through here during the season. Even if only half of them go to my show, it cannot be. I waited for some mention of free tickets, but none was made. I was about as anxious to see Dworkin's show as I was to walk barefoot across the Mare Ibrium, but I asked with what enthusiasm I could force, What sort of act are you putting on, girls? I shuddered as I recalled the pathetic shop-worn chorus girls that Sam Lowe had tried to pass off last year on the gullible tourist of the spaceways. That show had lasted ten nights, nine more than it deserved to. There are limits even to the gullibility of earth lovers. Yes, girls, said Dworkin, but not what you are thinking, Martian girls. This was more interesting. 
even if the girls were now a little too old for the stage in the Martian capital, they would still get loud cheers on the moon. I knew. I started to say so, but Dworkin interrupted. And not the miserable girls they buy from the slave markets in Behastin. These girls I collected myself from the country along the upper canal. I repressed my impulse to show my curiosity. It could all be perfectly true, and if it were not, the opening night would tell. But it sounded a lot like one of Dorkin's taller tales. I had never been able to disprove any one of them, but I found it a little hard to believe that so many improbable things had ever happened to one man. However, I liked being entertained, if it doesn't cost me too much, so I finally said, I suppose you're going to tell me you ventured out into the interior of Mars, carrying a six-week supply of water and oxygen on your back, and visited the Zeo theaters on the spot. How old did you know? That is just what I did, solemnly affirmed my companion. He snorted again and looked at his glass. It was empty, but he tilted it into his face again in an eloquent gesture. No words were needed. I punched the symbols for Stika into the drink board on my side of the table. Then, after hesitating, I punched the to in signal. I must remember, though, that this was my second and last. His eighth shticker seemed to instill some animation into Dworkin. I know you feel skeptically, I mean skepticism, after my exploits. You will see tomorrow night that I speak true. Amazing, I said especially as I just happened to remember that three different expeditions from Earth tried to penetrate more than a hundred kilometers from Behastin, but either they couldn't carry the water and oxygen that far, or they resorting to breathing Mars air and never came back. And they were Earthmen, not Venusians who were accustomed to two atmospheres of carbon dioxide. My friend, you must not listen. It was so... It will always be so. The principle of induction is long exploded. I did indeed breathe Mars airs. Wait, I tell you how. He took another long swig of Stika. What your Earthmen did not realize was that they cannot acclimatate themselves as do we Venetians. You know the character of our planet made adaptability a condition of survival. It is true that our atmosphere is heavy, but on top of our so high mountains, the air is thin. We must live everywhere the space is so few. I first adapted myself on Earth to live. I was there a whole year, you will recollect. Then I go further. Your engineers construct air tanks that make the light the air of mountains thin. So I learn to live in those tanks. Each day I have spent one, two, three hours in them. I get so I can breathe air at one third the pressure of your already thin atmosphere. And at one sixth in the tension of oxygen. No, my friend, you could not do this. Your lungs burst. But old Dworkin, he has done it. I take with me only some water, for I know the Martians dare not give water, to trade some miniature kerosene lamps. You know they got no fuel oil now, only atomics. But these little lamps, they like for antiques, for sentiment, because they great-grandfathers used them. Well, I walk through Valhaus and did not stop. Too close by capital. Too close contact with men of other planets. I walk also through Burr and Zamat. 
I come to a place where they never see a foreigner named Tahasa. Oh, I tell you, the men of the other planets do not know Mars. How delightful, how unspoiled are the Martians. Once you get away from the people by the tourists, so spoiled. How wonderful. Across the sands to go free as birds. The so friendly greeting of the Martian men and the Martian women. Ah. Well, in Dasa, I go to a theater. Such lovely girls, you shall see. But I saw something else. That, my friend, you hardly believe. Dworkin looked down at his empty glass and snorted gently. I took the hint, although for myself I ordered the less lethal Martian Azadanati. I was already having difficulty believing parts of his narratives. It would be interesting to see if the rest of it were any harder. My companion continued. They not only have the chorus, which you have seen on Earth, imported from Mars, and such a chorus, such girls, but they have something else. You recall your terrestrial history? Once your ancestors had performers on the stage who did funny motions and said amusing remarks, the spectators to make laugh. I think you call it vaudeville. Well, on Mars they also have vaudeville. He paused and looked at me from under half-shut eyelids and grinned widely to show his reptilian teeth. I wondered if he'd really found something new. I would even be willing to pay for a glimpse of Martian vaudeville. I wondered if my Martian was too rusty for me to understand the jokes in the spoken lingo. They have not only men and women telling jokes, they have trained animals acting funny, Dworkin went on. This was too much. I suppose the animals talk too, I asked sarcastically. Do they speak Earth or Martian? He regarded me approvingly. My friend, you catch on quick. He raised a paw. Now, don't a conclusions jump. Let me explain. At first, I did not believe it either. They sprung it with no warning. On the stage came a tool. You know him, I think. And a shell deed. The shallow deed was riding a bicycle, I mean a monocle, one wheel. The ta'ul moved just as awkward as he always does and tried to ride a tandem four-wheeled vehicle, which had been especially for him made. In spite of my resolve, I chuckled. The picture of a ta'ul riding a four-wheeled bicycle pumping each of his eight three-legged joints up and down in turn while maintaining his usual supercilious and indifferent facial expression was irresistibly funny. Wait, said my friend and raised a paw. You have as yet nothing heard. They make jokes at the same time. The sure I did ask the to'ul who was that Toula I saw you with up the canal? And the Toul replies, That was no Toula, that was my Shikai. I doubled up laughing. Unless you have visited Mars, this might not strike you as funny, but I collapsed into a heap. I put my head on the table and wept with mirth. It seemed like five minutes before I was able to speak. Oh, no! Yes, yes, I tell you, yes, insisted my friend. He even smiled himself. If you don't know the social system of the Martians, 
There is no point in my trying to explain why the idea of a Taul being out with that neuter of neuters, a Shikai, was so devastatingly funny. But that suddenly was not quite the point. Did it happen? I had large doubts. Nobody had ever heard a Taul make any sort of sound, and it was generally supposed that they do not have vocal cords. And no, she or deed, they somewhat resemble a big groundhog and live in burrows along the canals of Mars, had ever been heard to make any noise except a high-pitched whistle when frightened. Now, just a minute, Dworkin, I said. I know, my friend, I know. You think it impossible. You think the talking is faked. I thought so, too, but wait. It seemed Dworkin had inquired among the audience as to who owned the performing animals. The local Martians were not as impressed as he was with the performance, but they guided him to the proprietor of the trained animal act. He was a young Martian, hawk-nosed with flashing black eyes, dusky skin, and curly hair. I say to him, this Martian, Dworkin continued, if your act on the level is I buy. I had three small diamonds with, he explained. But the Martian, he was hard to deal with. First, he said he would not sell his so valuable and so beloved animals. The only talking animals on Mars, he said, the liar. At long last, I get him to make a price but on the condition that he bring me the animals around to my inn in the morning for a private audition. I suppose, I interrupted, you are beginning to have some doubts as to the Martian's good faith. After all, a talking to Ool and a talking she Shiaudid all at the same time is quite a lot to ask. I would have, please, my friend, please, interrupted my companion. Do you not think old Dworkin knows these things? Of course he does. I think, the owner, he is pulling a fake, I guess. I know that animals do not really talk. Next morning, I think he no show up. But no, I am mistaken. Roughly at nine o'clock, he come to my inn with a little dog cart with the animals. He puts them on the stage in the bar of the inn. They act like before. But they didn't talk, of course. Oh, no, my friend. That's where you are wrong. They talk like nobody's business. The jokes are funnier than ever, even dirtier, perhaps. But Dworkin is not fool. He thinks, aha. I say to the Martian, you fake this, what? The animals not talk? Suppose you have them do the act while you outside stay, what? Then I think I have them. The Martian tear his curly hair, flash his black eyes. He takes insult that I think he has fake. Name of the Martian gods, he cry. But at last he agreed to go away and tell the animals to go ahead. Dworkin, you were a sap to string along with him even that far, I said wearily. I hope you hadn't paid the guy any money. He shook his head. No, my old and blessed, he said. Dworkin, no fool is, even on Mars. No, no money. But wait. The animals go on without the owner. Same stage business, same talk, same jokes. Even funnier yet. What? I stared at Dworkin. He did not smile, but he finished off his eleventh shtick. The fifth I had bought him. Listen, I said, are you sitting there telling me that you have a Taul and a Shiardid that can really talk? Listen, my friend, like you, I think something is wrong. I say to Martian owner, my friend, maybe I buy your act 
if you tell me how it is done. But you know as well as I do that it is impossible to these animals to talk. Tell me what is the trick. Dworkin lifted his glass and shook it, as though he could not believe it was empty, then looked at me questioningly. I shook my head. He snorted, looked melancholy, writhed up from his chair, and reached for his fur cape. Well, thanks for the drinks, he said. A dark suspicion crept into my mind, but I could not restrain myself. Wait, Dworkin, I shouted. You can't just leave me up in the air like that. What happened then? Dworkin snorted into his green handkerchief. The Martian admitted it was a fake after all, he said mournfully. Can you imagine it? What a chiseler. The shield, he said, can't really talk. The Taul just throws his voice. End of Show Business by Boyd Ellenby